good morning or uh, good afternoon and maybe even a very good evening to everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar regarding the open call for proposals of the Common Fund for Commodities. Uh, this is a webinar, so uh, in principle, anybody can address us, but uh, we will ask you to uh, keep your microphones turned off unless you are going to speak. Uh, the webinar will take us one hour. There was a mistake in a Zoom calendar invite that said two hours. No, it's one hour, as was uh, announced everywhere else on the website and the so social media. Uh, we, uh, my name is Andrei Kuleshov. I'm a Chief of Strategy of the Common Fund for Commodities. And also uh, from the CFC, we have Mr. Nikolaus Krome, who is the Chief Operations Officer of the CFC. So we will be doing most of the talking and answering most of the questions. Uh, my colleagues are watching the uh, meeting room, to uh, the virtual meeting room, to help us uh, keep it organized. Uh, some uh, technical notes. If uh, you get disconnected, uh, you can reconnect with the same credentials and somebody will admit you back into the virtual meeting room. Uh, also, uh, as I already mentioned, you kindly ask to keep your microphone muted if you are not speaking. And it is... Uh, more convenient, especially if the connection is not very good, to answer questions using the chat function of uh, the Zoom. So please do not hesitate to ask your questions in the chat function. Uh, since this question comes up uh, always uh, in uh, the conduct of those webinars, yes, we will share the presentation with all people who registered for the webinar. So we will email the presentation that you're about to see to everyone. And uh, with this uh, introductory words, oh yes, one more thing that uh, we are going to try to hold the Q&A session to the end of the presentation. So we'll get through the presentation and then we will take questions and give our answers because many of the questions that are being asked, are basically they will be answered in the course of the presentation. So with that, we move on. And uh, it's generally in the context of the Common Fund for Commodities. And these are the topics that we are going to cover. First, a few words about ourselves, who we are and what we do. Uh, next, uh, the reasons why the Common Fund exists and operates in the commodity sector. Uh, then we will talk about the specifics of the open call for proposals. And then we will talk about issues that need to be filled in in the application form for the uh, for the CFC. I hope this will uh, get us exactly within one hour and uh, we will be able to answer a few questions. So firstly, the Common Fund for Commodities, uh, not as widely known as other international organizations. Uh, it is an international financial institution, intergovernmental financial institution. So it is established by member countries. Uh, currently, there are 101 member countries who own the CFC. It is uh, recognized by the United Nations. And in principle, the agreement establishing the Common Fund for Commodities is deposited at the United Nations. The CFC has the status of the observer in the United Nations. Uh, this is our connection. And the agreement establishing the Common Fund for Commodities was negotiated under the UN. Uh, the CFC started in 1989, so we're counting 34 years of existence. Over this time, uh, the CFC has financed over 500 uh, value chain, commodity value chain projects. The total project cost almost 800 million. Uh, in 2014, the CFC has undergone a deep 
reform, which makes many things possible, including this webinar. And the foundation of the reform of the CFC was uh, the pivot to impact investing. So since 2014, the CFC positions itself as an intergovernmental impact investment fund that operates in the commodity value chains that benefit commodity dependent developing countries. In this framework, the CFC invested uh, over 52 million US dollars in 50 projects, 50 loans. Uh, currently, uh, 38 million portfolio outstanding. And over the time of its existence, the Common Fund for Commodities had activities in almost 199 countries, to be specific. So in general, we operate, uh, well, almost everywhere as long as the country is a member of the Common Fund for Commodities. Now, a few words about the commodity sector. So what is the foundation? Why is the CFC engaging in commodities? Uh, firstly, there has been recognition for decades that commodity dependence is at the root of poverty of billions of people. And the estimate of 2 billion people was made some while ago, and it is <clears throat> probably quite valid still, and probably even higher, because the degree of commodity dependence is not exactly uh, reducing. The degree of commodity dependence uh, by different measures uh, remains very, very high for developing countries. So the CFC targets impact investment in the commodity sector, specifically in the innovation in the commodity value chains to advance income generation, to advance the reduction of poverty related to commodity dependence. And with the idea of enabling commodity dependent developing countries to generate incomes from commodities to be able to diversify and break out of commodity dependence and build a successful uh, developing economy, uh, reaching sustainable development goals, reaching its social aspirations, and so on. So the driver of change for the CFC is the effective commodity value chain supplying local and global markets in a way that generates sufficient rewards for the people who produce and trade and process and are otherwise involved, otherwise involved in commodities, making a fair living, gaining a fair benefit from their role in the global commodity sector. The current issues on the agenda include uh, obviously the green recovery from uh, the pandemic, uh, sustainable green economy, uh, nutritional security still remains an issue. New technologies, new developments, uh, such as digitalization, and also uh, the understanding of the uh, vulnerabilities and biases and injustices related to social state status, to gender, to other vulnerable groups. They are all targets for the CFC. Uh, being a uh, member-based organization, the CFC works with a huge number of partners. Uh, in most of the countries involved in the CFC, we have our contacts. Many international agencies are our uh, regular contacts and participants in our activities. We also participate in the work of other international organizations. So all in all, this is captured by the words on the slides that we encourage and we operate through multi-stakeholder collab collaboration to address all issues related to commodity dependence from all sides in all possible dimensions. The CFC appreciates additionality, uh, partnership and innovation in its projects uh, because they fit with the vision and mission of the CFC. And that is once again to allow commodity dependent people and commodity dependent countries to overcome persistent poverty related to commodities 
by unlocking the income generating potential of the commodity value chains in the interest of the poor and vulnerable people. This is a very important uh, diagram that uh, shows the main uh, operational modality of the CFC. Uh, we start at the, at the center with the small and medium enterprises. The focus of the CFC is small and medium enterprises. We know that those SMEs uh, procure their produce from smallholder farmers. So typically in a developing commodity dependent country, a small and medium enterprise would be getting uh, things from smallholders that they process, add value, and generally convert into a product that is demanded on high value markets. We say international markets, but it is generally high value markets, markets that are rewarding enough to generate sufficient value that the small and medium enterprises can pass back to the smallholder farmers. And the CFC enabling role in this is to provide financial resources to the SMEs. And these are the main instruments. And this is, by the way, this is not theoretical. This is the practical experience of the CFC. This is what we do. If there's a new instrument that is missing from this diagram, we can consider that. We can work on that. We're always looking for innovation. So currently, we are providing trade finance, uh, capital expenditure, uh, working capital, and some quasi-equity instruments to the small and medium enterprises that promise or that expect to generate value in the commodity value chains by engaging uh, between the international markets, high value markets, and the primary producers, the smallholder farmers. And of course, because of our impact expectations, we'll talk more about it later, uh, we do look for SMEs that treat the smallholders in a fair and equitable way, that smallholders get a fair benefit for the products that they supply through the SME to the global markets. So this is uh, the general picture of what the CFC is looking for in its project. We're open to new ideas. We're open to discuss discussion on other financial instruments and so on. So with this picture in mind, we can go on to the CFC open call for proposals, uh, where we will cover two things, uh, what we're looking for in the proposals and what the application process is going to look like. So first, so what is it that the project might evolve that makes it interesting to the CFC? Typically, it will be a... Uh, project uh, or investment in the agricultural commodity sector. <clears throat> the CFC constitution does not prohibit us operating in other commodity sectors, but from practical experience over the past 10 years, we see that most demand for the type of products or financial products that the CFC offers, this demand comes from the agricultural commodity sector. Uh, we need to have a focus in the investment proposal. It has to be an enterprise, a business, a cooperative, any other institution or organization that's active in the commodity sector can apply and can make the proposals for the use of CFC's resources within the framework that I've just outlined that in the end contributes to sustainable development goal and to the vision and mission of the CFC. It is highly preferable. Uh, commodity sector has existed for a long time. And what we see is the outcome of certain inefficiencies or injustices when it comes to poverty in the commodity sector. It's the outcome of injustices, inequity that is established by the existing structures of the commodity sector. And therefore, we look for innovation that can change this. So the question that we will be asking ourselves in reviewing an investment proposal, 
what is the innovation that will make this investment proposal beneficial to their poorest and most vulnerable people in the commodity value chain so that they get a chance to improve their livelihood by participating in this investment project. So innovation for positive change is a significant factor in our search for qualifying investment proposals. Some, uh, some uh, subjects are listed on the screen. And again, this is from practical experience. So we uh, look for agroforestry, for climate smart agriculture. We have invested in uh, renewable energy as well as food security in prevention of deforestation, uh, digitalization of agriculture, uh, financial inclusion uh, generates a lot of demand for CFC financing, and we have more ideas. So ideas, new ideas, always welcome. However, all those ideas, they need uh, on uh, the type of investments that the CFC makes, uh, those ideas need to be able to demonstrate their financial viability. So we look for, we are not a uh, venture capital or startup financing fund. We look for some background in our investee companies, organizations that demonstrate that they can manage their finances in a sustainable way because the CFC involvement is always finite. So the CFC investment term will expire after a few years. And after that, we expect that the operation, that the business, uh, that the small and medium enterprise will remain viable after the CFC financing is withdrawn. That's what we understand under financial viability. So we expect the investment proposal to demonstrate that it can, let's say how it will progress from today to the future seven years from now, remaining operationally sustainable, maintaining its capacity to grow and using CFC investments effectively to expand its contribution to the commodity value chain. Uh, some preconditions, so for all applications, we require that it's based, that the operation is based in the CFC member country and generally as evidence of the viability of the institution requesting of CFC financing, we need three years of audited financial statements. So now uh, to the application process, and you already see that there's a lot of uh, boxes to check and a lot of uh, things to test for uh, in applying for CFC financing. The CFC operates through the open call. It means that anybody can apply. Uh, the only uh, real requirement is that the organization or institution applying to the CFC must have a legal personality. And that is that means that they must have the possibility of signing an agreement with the CFC. There's no point discussing an idea if somebody cannot sign a loan agreement with the CFC uh, because the CFC will not be able to provide funding without a loan agreement. Uh, the open call runs on constant six monthly cycle with two deadlines in a year. So one deadline is approaching, that's 1st of October. The next deadline will be something like 1st of April, uh, Nicholas can correct me uh, later. You will see the detailed calendar in a few slides. So basically uh, twice a year, we collect all the projects received so far and they enter the cycle that you see on the screen. So after 1st October, then the applications are going to be screened by the CFC Secretariat. That's when every proposal will be read by somebody in our office, and they will complete a checklist, a quick review checklist, indicating that the proposal meets the minimum requirements that I was explaining a few moments ago. So if this checklist comes positive, then the proposal can proceed and be evaluated in detail by the CFC Consultative Committee. Now, the CFC Consultative Committee is a group of nine independent experts 
appointed by member countries on two-year term and elected, uh, elected every two years, uh, who represent they are directly from the commodity sector. So, for example, we have uh, people from the cocoa sector, from the coffee sector, we have people from international finance, uh, we have people from other, uh, other agricultural branches. They're all practitioners, they're all people with hands-on experience of operating in the commodity value chains. So uh, a investment proposal that's coming to the consultative committee will get reviewed for its technical soundness. The question, the basic question that we ask the consultative committee, is this going to work? Is this proposal oper operationally viable? It, does this proposal make sense? Uh, the consultative committee meets face-to-face uh, -face in person twice a year. So, uh, well, actually once a year, now, now that's just been changed. So once a year they meet by teleconference and once a year they meet face-to-face -face in person. And they take the whole week to go through all the proposals one by one, discuss their technical feasibility. If they are satisfied that the proposal is sound, they would typically uh, come back with the recommendations on the key terms and conditions, that there are certain things that need to be tested, verified, otherwise uh, checked, evidenced, and so on. Uh, recommending to the Secretariat to seek the approval by the Executive Board if those conditions can be met. So if the proposing organization can answer all the questions that have been put forward by the Consultative Committee, then the CFC Secretariat will prepare submission to the Executive Board of the CFC, and the Executive Board decides, again, meets twice a year, decides on uh, finance, approval of uh, financial support for the proposal. And again, we will see the calendar for this current call in just a few slides. So to complete the cycle, uh, once the executive board has given its approval, the executive board uh, meets in April and in October, and you can already see the connection cycle to cycle. So it's all tightly organized. So uh, consultative committee, executive board, at the same time, the next call for proposal ends, and then the next cycle of the projects uh, go, goes forward. So now uh, we uh, close this current call on the 1st October. It will be prepared for the consultative committee and then we'll go to the executive board and the executive board will decide in April. And in April, at the same time, the next call will be closed and this will go to the next cycle to be decided in October 2024. So once the executive board has given its approval, uh, do note that this consideration will be on the basis of the application form and information provided to the CFC Secretariat. So up to the EB approval, we will not do uh, spot checks on uh, the facts contained in the proposals. Uh, once a proposal has been approved, then we will do a desktop due diligence, uh, propose non-binding term sheet to the uh, organization proposing the projects. Uh, if we agree on the non-binding term sheet, somebody from the CFC office will come in person for on-site due diligence. And upon satisfactory conclusion of on-site due diligence, we will draft the contracts and eventually conclude the final contract and the loan agreement to unlock CFC financing for this. We do expect and we hope that all projects are receiving approval by the executive board can get started within 12 months after approval. So for, for this process of uh, due diligence, uh, conclusion of legal documentation and so on. Uh, it doesn't always happen. And the CFC will not hold its resources locked up for project proposal for more than two years. So in general, if uh, 24 months after approval by the executive board, a certain project, a certain investment has not concluded the legal documentation, has not started. That means that the CFC has the right to withdraw its commitment under the so-called sunset clause approved by the executive board so that the money can be committed for some other uh, proposal. 
So hopefully it doesn't happen in this uh, in this current call. And uh, as I promised just a few slides ago, this is the calendar of the 23rd current open call for proposals. So by uh, 1st October is the deadline. So whatever we receive by the 1st October will enter the next cycle. Uh, up to end November, the applications will be screened by the CFC Secretariat. So we will be reading the papers and completing the checklists. <clears throat> In December, one month before the meeting of the consultative committee, we must send all the documents to the consultative committee and we will. In January, 2024, the consultative committee will review the projects, the, the proposals received. And between February and March, 2024, we have the time to check with the project proponents uh, on any questions raised by the consultative committee. And if those questions are said, answered satisfactorily, then we can make the submission to the executive board that's going to meet in April 2024, and this will be the final decision. Uh, it, the outcome uh, of the project cycle will be communicated after the executive board meeting in April 24. And uh, because of the high volume of uh, proposals received in the open call, uh, the CFC uh, will only be able to communicate with the proponents who received positive review by the governing bodies of the CFC. So if you do not hear from the CFC by April 2024, it probably means that your project proposal has not been successful. You can always uh, apply again with the same or amended project proposal. There is no exclusion based on the past uh, experience. So uh, we are now moving on to the application form. So this is this is the mechanics. So this is how a project proposal is made to the to the CFC. Uh, a proponent downloads the application form from the CFC website, completes it, and sends it to the open call address of the Common Fund for Commodities. So now we are going through the content of the application form. Now, before we do that, uh, a few disclaimers that uh, there are no fees payable to the CFC at the application stage. Uh, it is entirely up to the proponents to use or not to use consultants in preparing their applications. But if anybody tells you that the CFC is asking for a fee to submit an application, this is not true. The CFC does not charge any fees at the application stage. Also, uh, we expect, and uh, there were, there's a checkbox uh, to acknowledge that the application uh, form contains complete and accurate information because we will check it. If the proposal is successful at the due diligence stage, we will check that the application information, that, it, that this is correct and accurate. Uh, so uh, the, re the request is only to provide uh, complete and accurate information already at the stage of application form. Uh, as I already mentioned, so the CFC will correspond only on uh, pro proposals that receive support from the governing bodies of the CFC. There is also a certain exclusion list that's standard for international organizations. Uh, there are some kinds of activities that the CFC will not support. Uh, an important qualification is uh, regarding confidentiality uh, that we will uh, need to have the right to share information contained in the application form with the governing bodies of the CFC, with the consultative committee and the executive board for the purpose of considering this application. Uh, if the application form contains uh, sensitive or uh, otherwise uh, otherwise confidential information, please indicate this clearly and please do give the CFC permission to share this information with the executive board and the consultative committee for the purpose of considering the, the uh, proposal. 
And uh, last but not least, uh, the, the application form needs to be submitted to the general email address, opencallcommonfund.org. Also question, questions can be sent to the same address. Uh, this is address that is uh, constantly checked, and this is address that's uh, that that where you will get a reply. So we always aim to reply to all messages sent to this open call address. So uh, this concludes the generalities. And for the specifics of the application process, I would like to uh, transfer the microphone to. Uh, okay, sorry, there was some noise. Yeah, so I would like to transfer the microphone to Nicholas Krome, the Chief Operations Officer of the CFC, for the details of the application process. Nicholas. Yeah, thank you, Andre. Greetings from me, and thank you for your interest in the Common Fund for Commodities and our call for proposals. Uh, yeah, as Andre said, we now turn to the proposal template in detail and we will or I will walk you through Andre also a bit through the template as you find it on our website and we do that chapter by chapter and in here you already see chapter number one uh, organizational background under one one we simply would like to know uh, how your company is registered what legal personality it does have and, and how long it has been in business and we would also appreciate sort of a single framing introductory sentence. Uh, what is it that you do, how you character characterize your, your business? Uh, uh, for example, we are a macadamia nut processor and trader uh, in country X and Y, and we export uh, these and these products to those countries. And we have an outgrowth scheme, something like that. So we can easily grasp whom are we dealing with. Huh? Under our one, two location and target markets we would like to ensure that our activities really are to be that we are going to finance uh, will be in a cfc member countries we have 101 and we want to learn a little bit more about uh, the physical location of the business and and the target markets one three we ask you really one or two sentences to briefly summarize what funding is sought yeah and what is it going to be used for and i think that's already it for chapter number one. If we go to two, that would be the next slide. Yeah, it, that deals with the type of finance that we offer. And here you are asked to indicate which type of finance you request. But for as a gen, general uh, uh, yeah, disclaimer for all types of finance that we offer, the, the following uh, really is valid and, and to be <clears throat> considered that our share of financing does not exceed 50%. Now, what does that mean? Yeah, for the specific undertaking that you apply CFC financing from, we require other sources, and that must be shown in the financial projections of at least 50%. Now, that can be other loans, that can be your own equity or retained earnings, Yeah, any of those, uh, but assets that are not shown, demonstrated in your financial statements, cannot be accepted as co-financing. However, we are not been counting on this and you can be creative here. Yeah? The other thing is that uh, when we decide to come to an agreement with you, we enter into what we would consider a partnership agreement. Yeah. So even if we do a loan, only a single loan cycle for a trade finance deal, which is only 12 months, we will seek to provide you with a three to five year framework contract in which we will stipulate our general willingness to renew the facilities for a few years when certain conditions are met. Uh, last thing I want to mention here is interest rates. And I already saw it in the chat that that uh, that, that is very important uh, and, and it's understandable. Now, our interest rates are de determined by uh, an individual risk profile uh, that we elaborate. And that is a combination. The base of the interest rate is the government borrowing rate, bond rates in US dollar or euros in the country where the CFC loan will be issued. And that will be complemented by a risk markup that is uh, a result of an assessment of, of your company and what you want to do. Now, as a rule of thumb, these rates currently go between five and 12% uh, per year. 
Um, if you move to the next slide, we will go to the first product or the products that we offer. There are three broad categories. Talk the first one, it's a classic term loan. That's for CAPEX investments. Example is an improvement or if you want to rehabilitate your palm oil mill or you want to expand your cocoa plantation. As I mentioned earlier, the loan term usually three to five years, but sometimes it's even longer. For example, if you're planting or want to plant perennial tree crops, yeah, uh, uh, and then we go up to seven years. And sometimes we also give grace periods if we see that there is no cash inflow for the first one or two years. This is always tailored to the needs of the investing. Second, trade finance. That is our most popular product. Uh, this ranges from pure trade finance uh, against shipment docks, yeah, but can also extend up to the point where a company needs funding to go out and purchase raw material at the beginning of the season in order to process and ship it. The standard structure in, in this is really that we finance against purchase orders yeah, of off-takers, overseas off-takers, and to have a tripartite agreement with the final off-taker with direct payment to the CFC. How it happens is that we get the money from the invoice, we take our share, and then we transfer the money uh, to you, to the company. Now, when we do have established some relationship with our investee, then we also look in the option of providing more untied working capital facilities with some less control over cash. Sometimes we do this under what is called the collateral management agent structure, where somebody is monitoring what's in your warehouse. Um, uh, as a rule of thumb, the longer the cash conversion cycle, that is, we give the money, you buy the avocado, and, and how long it will take until that avocado gets back into cash, Yeah, the more likely is that we ask for other securities. And there will be pledges on inventory receivables or, or, or guarantees. So I just mentioned an example would be if you produce avocado oil, you need to buy the avocado, you need to process it, you need to ship it. And then until the Aldi or Albert High market in Europe pays you is another 90 days. So you have a lot of, yeah, you have 180 days to go or the same thing what we have had in the past is the mango puree for Mali. Uh, the next slide deals with equity stakes. Uh, we so far, I have to admit, have not invested into equity of single companies simply because this absorbs too much capacity. And we're a small uh, a group of people here in Amsterdam. What we occasionally do is that we invest equity into impact investing funds if there are interesting propositions, but we do that with relatively small ticket sizes. One product uh, that is of high strategic importance to us also on that list, and that is development impact bonds. Now, what is meant here is, uh, in simple terms, uh, it, this is a construct that ensures that the ultimate payer for development impact, be it a government or, or, or a foundation, uh, uh, only pays for the impact if and also only to the amount of impact that is being delivered ex post. So in practice, if one of you happen to be an NGO with a great project idea or a proposal for a technical assistance project in the agri sector, and you do also have a sponsor on the other end that would be willing to pay, but only after the impact has been delivered, then we as the CFC would be interested to becoming the party that pre-finances you and takes on your performance risk. We believe that this model has a bright future because sponsors do no longer have to pay out in advance against a claim that then will materialize or in many cases will not. There is a link, I believe, in the online application with an example. Okay, the number two, three, that would be the next slide, would be fast track finance. Now, that, that more or less has to do with a shorter process. Uh, up to 300,000 uh, uh, US dollars. Proposals with these smaller ticket sizes can be submitted under this fast track procedure. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, these fast track can either be loans and also grants, but please note that in recent years, the success rate has been limited. Yeah, so if you are looking for grant-based fast-track finance, these projects must be highly innovative. They must be of strategic importance for the CFC, and they must have a 
substantial additionality. They really must stand out. Yeah, We do this in, in some cases, but not very often as an expectation management discipline. Right, then we move to chapter three of the template, management and operations. Now, what do we want to know here? Under 3.1, management and ownership. We would like to have an answer to those questions like who are the shareholders of the company? Are there any other ultimate beneficiary owners apart from shareholders? Is the company part of a holding or with sister companies or in what context is that company to be seen? Is there a board and who sits on the board and why? And regarding to management, who are the key persons running the company? What do they bring to the table? Uh, the skills and expertise of the management are uh, uh, complementary. These are the kind of things we want to know. If you have CVs, please attach them to the proposal. We would be very interested. It's very helpful for us. Under 3.2, we would like to understand your current business model. Now, this is where many have difficulties. Uh, uh, just expect that we know nothing about your company. So start with saying we are company X and we produce and process product Y for X export to country X, Y, Z. It's as simple as that. And then where do you source from? What processing steps do you do? When, you have, when have you been established? Where are you located? Where and who are your target customers? How many employees and skills of the employees? sales, production volumes, capacity for production and processing, etc. This is what we would like to know so we can form a picture of your company. The goal is that at, uh, with this chapter that the reader has a good high level understanding what you do, how you do it, and at what size level. In many proposals, we do find it very difficult to understand and to up interpret your business case and whom, with whom we are dealing with. This does not need to be long, but it needs to be concise and with figures where possible. The next chapter that is four, next slide, and that is on market opportunity. Now that is not around with your business, but what is around your business and how does your business fit in, in this environment? Under 4.1, we would like to know in what market or industry you are or you see yourself. Is it competitive? Is it with a lot of pressure? Or are you differentiated to an extent that you fill a niche? Do you compete on price? Do you compete on quality? Or do you not compete at all because you have some unique selling points of your product? Do you have more than one product? And what is your main revenue generator? These are the kind of questions that we would like to have answered. One key information that we also want to know under this chapter is how do you currently secure your supply? Do you secure it from smallholders? Do you do it from spot market or do you have longer term supply contracts with your smallholders? Are you even integrated backwards with your own farms? Huh? That is of great interest to us because this is usually what Andre has explained earlier, where social impact lies for us. And that's we want to learn, learn or know a lot about. And then we want to know, on the other hand, who is your main off-taker and how do you market your products? How do you ship? What's your relationship to your off-takers in the long term at arm's length? What are the barriers to entry into your market that determines competition? Who are your main competitors? If you have the names, if you have an indication of the size, it would be good to know. And also any other macro level information. Yeah, Are there any legal issues, environmental issues, political, technological issues? Yeah, For example, there's your, the industry you work in, do you expect any game changes in these laws that will prohibit something, new technology that will make other technology obsolete? We are interested. 4.2 is a chapter where we want you to express in a few sentences what makes you better than your competitors. Where do you see your strength? Yeah? Be it your staff, be it your efficiency, unique product, price leadership, customer relations. Please let us know. And there, here is the time not to be shy. Yeah? Because under 4.3, we want you to answer the same for obstacles, for your weaknesses. Yeah? We will ask you in this proposal, where do you see your weakest points? Yeah? Where do you see you need to do better? And also try to work out any relationship to your proposal for funding. Yeah? Is it the CFC funding that you're going to use to improve yourself? Right. Um, chapter five. Next slide. In chapter five of the proposal, 
we want to know more on the proposed future operational model. So we now look from current into the future. We want to know how your anticipated future will look like with your business with CFC funding. Yeah? So what are your plans? How will your business look like after you have invested with CFC funding? Where will the effects be? Where What changes will take place? Yeah? Will you increase your capacity? Will you vertically integrate? Will you diversify your product range, expand into other another country, become energy independent or improve product quality? That's what we would like to know. Under 5.2, we would like to know how your customer, if and how your customer base is going to change. Will you, and it's likely, attract new customers? Yeah. Will you enter new markets with new products? Or will you just deepen markets uh, uh, with the products that, that, uh, uh, that you already have or in the markets that you're already in? Will there be a change in distribution channels? Will you be from, move from informal to more formal markets? Will you use different export countries? And one very important question that we would like to have answered, what currency will you be selling and dealing in? Under 5.3, on the supply side also, we would like you to elaborate what is it that you require in addition to operate when you use CFC money? How will you secure assumed higher supply requirements? Will you diversify your sourcing? Will you engage with outgrowers? Will you import? Is that associated with risk? I'm sure it is, but what risks do you see? How will you structure your supply? Will it be at arm's length? Will you spot trade or will you enter into long-term contracts? Will you even start to organize a supply chain? How is pricing on the supply? Is it local supply? Is it world market? Yeah, these are the questions that we are interested in. Under 5.4, we would like to know about any changes in your production and processing uh, uh, process. One perspective, do you add any additional value through adding or improving the processing step, uh, maybe by becoming traceable or organically certified or ending getting any obtaining any other certification? Another aspect is what is it going to change? What is going to change? Will you need more skilled staff? Are you engaging in a new processing technology where you need to be trained? Is, is there risk of failure for the technology? Do you have access to electricity or do you have other sources of reliable energy supply? Under five, five, um, that is basically wrapping it up under this chapter. Do you plan or do you apply any innovation? alongside the new investments that you want to make. Yeah? Will you start to engage with blockchain chain certification? Will you become traceable, organic? Uh, will you start with carbon certificate tracing, with, with trading? Will you use renewable energy? Yeah? These are the kind of innovative uh, activities that we would like to know. Even less spectacular, yeah? if you are the first one that will start growing peanuts commercially in a country, that's also for us an innovation, and uh, we would like to know about it. Before I hand back over to Andre to cover the development part. Uh, let me briefly summarize. Generally, kindly be as concise as possible and try to underline your information with quantitative figures wherever possible yeah? for yields, production level, staff, etc. Try to avoid what, what we call fogging yeah? uh, and, and, and do not fall for providing us with all the information that you have that 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 uh, with that kind of information dumping we get we get uh, we drown yeah we are fully aware that no business in this world is perfect yeah do not be afraid on self highlighting your deficiencies and also the possible risks your business is exposed to so as a reminder again at this proposal stage for us we need to get a clear but high level picture on your business to see if the business itself can be sustainable because that is then the basis for any development impact, which then becomes sustainable impact. Huh? Okay, Andre, I hand over to you for the next chapter. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Nikolaus. And uh, you might want to have a look at the questions in, in uh, the chat box in the meantime, as I was trying to answer some. Uh, and then there were questions about the interest rates and questions about uh, gray list section countries. So this is all acknowledged. So we'll try to take this up. Also, our hedging rates for repayment and so on. So Nicholas, do, do have a look. 
uh, for Q&A session. In the meantime, the development impact, so as an impact investor, <clears throat> the CFC requires uh, an impact assessment from the start of the project. And that means that in the impact session or section of uh, the application form, we expect to, to see the details, how the activities of the project will make contribution to the general uh, improvements of uh, livelihoods of the poor and underprivileged expressed in certain terms consistent with the sustainable development goals. So uh, we will look for uh, the core uh, sustainable development goals of the CFC. That's the goals uh, 1, 2, 5, 8, and 10, and recently added uh, climate change 13. Uh, do have a look at the Excel annex to the application form, which contains a separate page where you can indicate which impact indicators the proposal will be able to report on. Uh, we use the IRIS Plus metrics for impact assessment. It is extremely flexible and you can find almost any indicators there, but please do try to uh, find the indicators that you will be able to monitor and reflect consistently from the from uh, the based on the proposal. Uh, for example, the the amounts paid to smallholder farmers, uh, the amounts paid to workers, maybe the incomes generated in addition, maybe the volumes produced in terms of food security, and so on. In section 6.3, we ask a, a few questions about the poverty profile of the beneficiary uh, because we need to be able to assess the project impact, not just by itself, but in the context of the environment where it happens. In principle, macroeconomic statistics is available for most countries, also regarding poverty, but it may be that your proposal operates in a special poor and vulnerable area. It may be that you're targeting a specific group of population where poverty profile is different. Please do indicate because it will help us understand better that the proposal is actually highly beneficial through the commodity sector. Uh, the CFC takes uh, special care to look at social and environmental risks. Uh, we employ uh, the uh, social and environmental risks management system, and that's a gold standard uh, developed by the International Labour Organization. So uh, do fill in any known social and environmental risks, and we will be assessing the project also from the standpoint of SEMS methodology to make sure that we do not create negative impacts inadvertently by missing some of the social and environmental risks. Uh, turning to uh, uh, the impact assessment in the end will need to be done using specific indicators. And you will see some examples in the Excel sheet. As I mentioned, we are using the IRIS Plus system. And uh, do well, do have a look at this at the website of the gene and the iris, and you can look at the Excel template. And I see that uh, the time is almost running out, so we have five minutes left. So I am going to quickly uh, get to the financial performance slide with Nicholas where it will be addressed again back to the uh, spreadsheets provided. Yeah, thank you very much. I try to be swift. Uh, so alongside your narrative business case that, that uh, uh, we will ask you in the, in, in the proposal, we would also like to assess the financial strength and, and performance of your business. Yeah. So in, basically let the numbers tell the story and we do that in in uh, uh, chapter seven. So in principle, we will ask you to fill in two Excel sheet templates, which can be found on our website, uh, and, and which will show uh, we will show in the next slides. One is the balance sheet, uh, and the other is the uh, profit and loss statement. And, and we require you to, to fill in the factual 
past financial figures and the la of the last three years, and then also make a forecast of the next couple of years. Um, as a general uh, uh, highlight, we have to look at these figures in a structured manner uh, uh, and grasp the general notion of them very quickly. And, and that is why these templates are pre-structured. And that is why we kindly ask you not to amend the template. Yeah? Rather, try to make your figures fit into the structure. And, and when you do that, uh, try to ensure that we get a true and fair view on your financials. It will save us a lot of work if we do not have to find out at a later stage that some figures do not match with audited financial statements, which will be any, analyzed anyhow uh, later on. Again, here we know that there is hardly any business that comes with a shiny, super solid uh, uh, balance sheet and, and regular high net profits and, and tons of free cash. So in under 7.1, uh, uh, you have the chance to comment on the tables and, and provide some insights and explanations on the trends uh, that can be observed or, or uh, any up and downward figure that can be explained uh, uh, with an extraordinary event. There's the space for it. For projections in, in 7.2, Please provide us with your main assumptions. Yeah? If your project, if you project a, a, a steep hockey stick growth with a bright future, we need to know on what basis you do that. Yeah? Please inform us on the assumed prices, volumes of various products sold, et cetera, that, that you base your financial projection on. Seven three, we want to know your existing financing providers and, and what type of funding. Uh, you have uh, uh, received and also the amount. And we would like to learn why you turn to CFC for financing. So what is the additionality uh, of the CFC? Be it that you do not find additional finance uh, locally, that the interest rates are prohibitive or that the suitable loan product is uh, simply not available. Finally, in chapter 7.4, yeah, we ask you to list the main risks uh, uh, that you are facing and, and that you might face when you grow. Uh, with CFC funding, be open and transparent. There's no business in this world without any risks. And we know that anything related to agriculture is indeed risky. So whatever you write there, be rest assured that we can take it. On the next slide, you will uh, see a screenshot of the profit and, and loss statement. These are uh, Excel tables, should not be a surprise. And you should have somebody in, in your business, an accountant uh, uh, that should handle this with, with fair, fairly ease. Yeah. Next one is uh, the screenshot of a balance sheet. Same thing. Uh, uh, assets, liabilities. Also, somebody in your business should be able to to handle that. In surprises. Right. The final chapters I go through very quickly. Uh, there would be eight supporting documents. What is mandatorily required? You find under eight one audited financial statements, financial projections. We have just discussed. Impact indicators, Andre, uh, company registration documents, and and an organigram uh, that we would like to have. Not a must-have, but a nice-to-have. If you have a business plan, please add it. If you have any managerial, organizational charts or whatever, please add those things. If you have pitch decks, uh, uh, key staff resumes, please please add them. Articles of associations, uh, please provide them. And if you have ever undertaken environmental social impact assessment, please add, add this. Next uh, chapter is chapter nine, uh, merely some kind of uh, formal uh, uh, asks that we have on your company. And number 10 is that we would like to affirm certain things before you send it off. That brings me and Andre to the end of uh, our presentation. And I hand over back to Andre. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I tried to answer a few questions in the chat box. Perhaps one burning question would be about the interest rates. Uh, and it will be easier if uh, Nikolaus uh, says a few words about it uh, for everybody to hear. Right, again, interest rates. Uh, I think I have pointed out, say, I, I, I sort of say that again, uh, our interest rates is based on an individual risk profile that we make on, on your application and on your company. So if you are a company that has a very solid balance sheet, that has very, very, very solid customers, that has been net profitable for the last couple of years and is very mature, and we also have access or recourse to some collateral or have a good structure, for a trade finance deal, then uh, the interest rate uh, goes down to five or six percent uh, per year. Uh, that mm -hmm. this is, uh, and we are not heavily charging 
service fees and these kind of things. So the interest rate is the interest rate. Yeah, and that is that is all in. If you are uh, in primary agriculture, uh, in production, uh, which is price dependent, weather dependent, and pest and diseases dependent, and there is a high volatility in the global markets, and you want to expand your perennial uh, tea crop orchard, uh, uh, tree crop orchard, then uh, interest rates can go beyond 10%, yeah? because your risk is, is uh, perceived to be too high. The base rate that we usually take is the government uh, borrowing rate of your country in US dollars uh, or, or uh, in euros. Now, if that is prohibitively high, uh, we make an assessment and a real uh, a sort of a sanity check and uh, uh, we'll come to some kind of conclusion where the interest rate will be. In summary, uh, my experience is that if we want to provide you with a loan, and if you really want a loan from the CFC and you are serious about the CFC and about your business, we have always come to some kind of conclusion. Yeah, Let me stop here. <laughs> yep. Okay, uh, so uh, there's uh, a number of questions in the chat box that uh, ask about uh, green energy, uh, renewable energy, and so on. And a single answer to all those questions that, in principle, we have considered such projects, they are eligible as long as they meet the basic qualification criteria that the proposal is based in the commodity value chain. So it's link, if it's linked in the commodity value chain, renewable energy is perfectly okay for an application. Uh, there, was, there were a number of questions about small amounts, like uh, 30 or 50,000 US dollars. And in our experience, it is, uh, we, let's say we have not seen a case of such a proposal that was financially viable. So the answer is probably no, it will not fly. But if you think otherwise, if you believe there are reasons that it may fly, then uh, please do complete the application form. Uh, we will not be able to say, uh, uh, to speak other than in generalities about the questions regarding the feasibility of certain project ideas, because we have to see the details. Uh, most of the ideas, if they're not on the exclusion list, they may be eligible for financing, but we have to look at the details because that's where uh, the real challenge is. Uh, the presentation will be uh, shared. Uh, so I will uh, quickly look at, uh, at the uh, other questions in the chat box that require and answer yes. So do we finance startups? Uh, Nicholas, uh, maybe you can say a few words about uh, generally not being able to finance startups. Yeah, we, we, we do not because the risk profile usually is, is too high and, and loan finance is not, is in, in most cases, not, not the appropriate uh, financial product. Usually you need equity and, and uh, uh, equity investors in this. Uh, that's why, why we usually do not. If you think that you have a compelling case uh, uh, and, and that this is a super secure thing, please submit an application. The whole thing is not gonna be more than 20 pages uh, and we will read it, but the chances are not very high. And one more question, Nicolas, about the interest rate again. Do we have a hedging rate? Uh, for our loans in the environment of uh, of uh, high inflation, do we have a hedging rate? No, and I, I have read it, and I have to uh, freely admit that I do not fully understand understand the question. What we provide is fixed interest rates, so uh, I, I don't know whether that answers the question. If not, get in touch with me, uh, and I will uh, I will discuss or, or get you uh, together with with a colleague who, who then should know about it. And the question, uh, do we finance uh, subcontracting companies in the mining sector? In principle, I believe that the mandate of the CFC does cover this, uh, but we would need to have an individual look at it, that there are ESG risks and also environmental risks uh, uh, associated with this. Now, if that is going to be a, a, an investment or a project that is actually mitigating those risks, I think we would we would be interested, yeah? But we would need to look at this individually. 
Right. So I believe that I'm at the end of uh, the question list in the chat box. Uh, again, uh, we will not be able, uh, I gave very general answers to uh, questions about specific project proposals, specific project activities. And my apologies for that, that we seem we have to look at the application form to give you an accurate answer. We cannot answer in general, almost anything is possible. But again, uh, the, uh, the real answer will depend on the details, which we have to see. So uh, a personal business existing for eight years and legally recognized, is it eligible to apply? Yes, probably. If, uh, if you can sign a loan agreement and if you are registered, good standing on the tax records and so on, then it is perfectly feasible. And uh, I guess uh, two more questions than uh, agri-cooperative to work on agribusiness focusing on the targeted commodities. I cannot answer that except in generality, yes. In general, yes, because it's not on the exclusion list. But the specifics we will need to see on the application form. Uh, website, etc. Uh, we do not fund startup. Uh, uh what about the time put in the application uh well that's uh please uh do consider carefully if uh, you meet the basic criteria for eligibility as we uh, discussed today in the presentation if you think you are a startup and if you think still that there are reasons why this startup needs to be completed Please do apply, but do be aware that uh, the track record of startups applying for CFC financing is extremely poor. So we do not encourage startups to apply, as Nicholas has said, because of the risk profile. So we are, okay, I think we can afford to run for two more minutes. Um, Yes, so there are details of the CFC web pages. And there was a question about Twitter page. Uh, we do not run one currently. Uh, we uh, may be opening a Twitter feed in the future. We will notify on the CFC web page. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, thank everyone. If your question has not been answered in the chat box, uh, then uh, please do email the uh, general CFC address. Uh, actually, the managing director is not the right one to email regarding the call for proposals. It is the open call at commonfund.org. So the address at the bottom of the page is the right email address to send the same kind of questions as you were sending in the chat box. And I want to thank everyone for participating and for staying with us. We have great attendance. We did try to, uh, to uh, answer as best we can. And please engage in the conversation by writing to open call or common fund org uh, for further details. Nicolas, any further thoughts? No, I, I just looked at the last uh, uh, messages here. I, 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 I'm sorry if, if, if there is a, one uh, uh, potential proponent that had obviously put potentially work into a proposal. I think it is even in our most frequently asked questions on our website that we do not finance uh, or, or we are hasting to, to finance startups. So apologies. Yeah, in general, I'd like to thank you. I like. I, I think it was 140 uh, participants. Thank you very much for your interest. Again, it is not more than 20 pages and uh, uh, be, be rest assured, all the proposals are being read. Yeah? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. And I wish you a very nice day. Uh, this uh, webinar is concluded and I thank you for coming. Please do write to us to open call and you will get a reply. Thank you very much.